welcome back to my channel. My name is Kim. I am a second year fourth grade teacher in West Michigan and I posted a video last week about behavior management in my classroom and in that video I mentioned the importance of being a trauma-informed teacher and I received a lot of comments, a lot of emails, a lot of direct messages of people asking me to please expand on that thought and tell more about what I know about being trauma-informed. Now I mentioned at the beginning, I'm only a second year teacher, so I still have a long way to go, but I do have a heart for working with children in trauma. I've known for a while that that's what I wanted to do, and I have had the opportunity to go to several professional developments through my college, through my school now, my school district, and I also attended the Trauma-Informed School Conference in St. Louis this year. So I have had quite a few professional development opportunities. However, that does not mean I'm the expert on trauma, my cat isn't either. Um, that doesn't mean I know everything there is to know. I couldn't possibly know everything there is to know. So I'm just going to share some little nuggets of advice and kind of just flush through these thoughts with you and maybe point you towards some more resources if you'd like to continue doing your research, which I would highly recommend. But if nothing else, I hope that this video helps at least one person out there. If this video helps even just one person, that will be so monumental for me and that will make this all worth it. So please leave me a comment below. Let me know if there's anything you'd like me to expand on or if there's anything you'd like to see in future videos but let's go ahead and for now just jump right into it and start talking about trauma so the main three types of trauma that you're going to see in children are abuse neglect and household dysfunction so you may have heard of the aces test before ace stands for adverse childhood experiences and there are 10 different types of aces i actually have their website pulled up right now so i'm just going to read them aloud to you um five of them are personal they're physical abuse verbal abuse sexual abuse physical neglect and emotional neglect and then five are related to other family members so having a parent who's an alcoholic a mother who's a victim of domestic violence a family member in jail a member a family member diagnosed with a mental illness and the disappearance of a parent through divorce death or abandonment so each of those types of traumas counts as one in your ACE score so if you're listening to that list and you're like yeah I can check this box that one that one and that one then you would have a higher ACE score than somebody who said nope I haven't had any of those things happen to me before so we all have some sort of ACE score and you would be amazed with the number of people who have higher ACE scores than you could imagine like a lot of people have um, multiple ACEs the more ACEs that you have in your ACE score, the higher the probability is that you are going to have some um, either health concerns, whether that's physical or mental, from that trauma. So the ACE scores just kind of document like the most common childhood traumas, but of course there could be other ones as well. And something that I think is really important to remember is how the adult or the caregiver, the guardian in the situation responds to the trauma with the child is going to greatly impact how the child is able to work through that trauma. So if your parents go through a divorce, but they're pretty civil to each other, you get to see both parents still, that is definitely still traumatic, but in a different way than you're gonna see if your parents are divorced and don't speak to one another and are disrespectful to one another, or one parent just leaves and you never get to see them again or they talk poorly about each other those two experiences while they still are both divorce are going to be different based on how safe and secure the child feels uh, in their own situation and in their relationships so if you're interested I will actually link below where you can take a test to see what your ACE score is I think it's really interesting and I think it helps build some empathy for the children who are going through these traumatic things who either have a history of trauma or are currently going through trauma trauma greatly affects the brain so as we know children's brains are still developing and when a child goes through trauma their brain actually develops differently than a child who is not going through the same type of trauma because stress has such a big impact on our brain so I'm gonna put up a little like graphic right here this is just something I found on Google I will try to say it below but I think that this is really interesting stress and trauma actually affects the temporal lobe um, which means that it becomes incredibly difficult for these children to learn how to self-regulate so that's a huge issue because regulation is so important think about when you go to the grocery store and somebody like accidentally rams their cart into you 
there are two different ways you could react, right? You could just say like, oh, sorry, and like apologize even though it's not your fault, or like, you know, have like a friendly little discourse with them, realize that it's not a big deal, or you could get really, really upset and really heated. And for somebody who's not able to regulate their emotions, they're gonna immediately go into fight or flight mode when they feel threatened, or when their window of tolerance is up. So I'd like to reference a book that I read that I really enjoyed. I've talked about it in previous videos. It's called Help for Billy and it was written by Heather Forbes. Heather Forbes is actually the person who ran the conference that I had the opportunity to go to. She is phenomenal. She's done a ton of research and just has some really, really great stuff out there. So I'd highly recommend looking into her practices and what she has done. But she in her book, Help for Billy, talks about two different types of students. She talks about Billy, who is a student who has faced trauma and Andy who's a student who has not faced the same types of trauma that Billy has and so Billy and Andy both have a window of tolerance okay let's talk about Andy first so Andy has two middle-class parents who both have decent paying jobs they're home with him at night they read to him every night make sure that his homework is done he gets tucked in at night uh, maybe a bedtime story read to him he has food in the cupboards and he is safe and secure and he feels loved at home so Andy has this window of tolerance that's pretty high Okay, he doesn't have a lot of things that he's bringing to school with him. Now, every kid has a story. There is no such thing as a blank slate kid. I don't want you to think that that is um, something that is true. So Andy still has things that he deals with and goes through, you know, because we all do. But when Andy goes to school, he feels safe and secure. He's well fed. He knows he's loved. And so he has all this room. So he has this window of tolerance, okay? And he gets to school and maybe he can't find his homework, okay? So that's a little bit stressful. So that's going into his window of tolerance. And then maybe his best friend is being really rude to him and really disrespectful and like doesn't wanna play with him at recess. That's stressful, that adds to that um, stress limit. And then maybe there's a pop quiz and now he's like way up here. But guess what, he still has this room. He hasn't had a blow up yet, but he is having a bad day. Now let's look at Billy. Before Billy gets to school, he doesn't have breakfast because he doesn't have any food in the cupboards. He ended up staying up late last night watching his baby sister because mom and dad were either sleeping or at work. He was listening to mom and dad fight recently and he's worried that they either will get a divorce or that one of the parents will start beating the other one again. Billy gets to school and can't find his homework. His stress window is up, okay? This is all that he had. So he had all this stuff that he was bringing to school with him already. All these things he was thinking about. Maybe he's tired, maybe he's hungry. He's going through a lot. And then all of a sudden he gets to school and can't find his homework and it's like game over because they, he can't handle one more thing. He doesn't have any room for one more thing. He is overwhelmed, he is exhausted, he is angry. And so you as the teacher might see that as, oh my goodness, this kid is so dramatic or this kid has to just you know cause a fuss at the beginning of the day and blah, 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 it's not a big deal that he doesn't have his homework or if he just did his homework, that wouldn't be the problem. He probably just didn't do it. So you as a teacher are only seeing your little piece of this picture, the piece of that kid that you are seeing in that moment. You don't always know about all the other stuff that Billy is going through before you get to see him for the day. And so it's so important to be empathetic and to be understanding and to be um, somebody who has built relationships with your students so then maybe you're getting to know all of those things in his window of tolerance. But all of a sudden now, Billy, you know, whether it's you know not having his homework or it's something else, maybe uh, you as a teacher kind of went like this to him and you didn't even realize you did it maybe. Well, that might have set him off. Maybe that's a gesture that he's deemed as being dangerous or being scary. And so now all of a sudden when he sees that, he's going to go, oh my gosh, I am threatened right now. And it's fight or flight mode that he gets into. He gets scared for his life. And so obviously he's going to, you know, get upset and maybe yell or maybe throw something or, or, you know, threaten somebody else. He's going to do that because he's scared. He's really, really scared. And this is a child. Okay. I don't care if you're working with seven year olds or 17 year olds. It is still a child, no matter what grade you teach. And you just have to remember like when a child is getting to that dysregulated state where like their window of tolerance is up, that window has bursted open. They're not going to act like their physical age. They're not going to act like seven or 17. 
they're going to act like the age when their ace started to occur or they're going to act like the age that they were when things were safe and things felt right their emotional age has not caught up to their physical age it is not the same not the same totally different so just because physically they're nine years old they might act like they're two or three. So now that we've talked about what trauma is, you're probably asking yourself, well, what do I do when a child is dysregulated like that? How do I help? What strategies can I implement in my room? And there's a lot. And you're really gonna have to work with the kid and figure out what works for this particular student because every child is different. And if you think about like how you cope with stress versus how I cope with stress, like I might need to go eat some ice cream and you might need to go for a run. Or I might need to talk it out with my husband and you might need to just be quiet and you know do your own thing for a while. Like everybody copes with stress differently. And that's gonna be the same for this student who is learning to regulate. This child does not know how to regulate properly on their own just yet. So you need to work with them and figure out how that regulation is going to take place. So it can be a lot of different things. A lot of people will say Maslow before Bloom, and I think that is so important. It is so important to take care of a child's social emotional needs before you can start teaching them. So if a child is dysregulated saying, you know what, we don't have time for that right now, right now you need to work on your math, well that might seem like a harmless thing to say, like that's just not going to work. That child is not going to be able to learn anything or really do anything productive until they are regulated. So the best thing that you can do when a child is dysregulated is help to regulate regulate them. Before a child becomes dysregulated though, before you have any of this happen, it's really crucial to have a positive classroom community in your classroom. So it is important to both model and explicitly teach what it means to be kind to one another, what it means to have empathy, uh, what it means to be a classroom family or a classroom community, whatever you choose to call it in your room. That stuff needs to be explicitly talked about and modeled because when you have a student who is dysregulated and maybe way up here and maybe doing or saying things that might make other children feel unsafe, it is important for the kids to know that that student just needs something a little bit different or that child is having a hard time in that moment rather than immediately going to, oh my gosh, I'm scared or stop doing that man, stop doing that. Um, if a child is immediately going right to that, then you have this huge shift in the classroom where you're trying to deal with your dysregulated student, but now all of your other students are dysregulated as well. So you're gonna be doing yourself a favor if you set yourself up for success and talk about it at the beginning of the year, like if anybody needs anything, this is what we'll do. Or if we have an emergency in the room, this is where we'll go. And you might have that happen sometimes where you have to evacuate the room because one student needs to be in there alone or it's gonna be dangerous for the other students to be in there. But make sure that you have those routines and procedures in place and that you've taught that compassion and that empathy because it makes everything else a whole lot easier. And in my classroom, I've just talked about like if somebody's having a hard time, do not look at them. Do not look because they don't need an audience. They need to deal with what they're dealing with. And when you look at them, that is so disrespectful to that student. And like, how would you feel if everybody was staring at you when you were having a hard time? And we just talk about that and it has made such a huge difference in my classroom and I can say 100% like when my students were having a hard time if I had a student who was dysregulated the rest of the class especially by like the middle to end of the year oh my gosh they just like kept doing their work they kept making it happen and I was able to then step aside and work with the student who needed extra help and extra attention in that moment having established rules procedures and routines in place is also going to make a huge difference for the students who have a history of trauma or are currently living in trauma, there is a lot of uncertainty and things that are unpredictable in their lives. And school should be somewhere where they feel safe and they know the routines and they know what's going to happen next. So it's really, really important that you have a posted schedule in your room so the students know what every day is gonna look like. We're gonna do math here and then we're gonna go to social studies and then we're gonna do English and then we're gonna go to art or like on Fridays we're going to gym. It's really important that those students have those routines because that makes them feel safe and secure. Now, that being said, when you have those unpredictable days that you can't help, like an assembly or a lockdown drill or something like that pop up, you need to understand that's probably going to set off your dysregulated student or your student who has trouble with regulation because those things are unpredictable and unpredictable is scary. And these students don't like surprises. And so while you may feel really good about your classroom transformation or this cool game that you have planned or whatever, and maybe most of the students in your class are excited as well, not everybody 
is going to be. That might make that student feel unsafe and feel worried and feel like um, they risk, you know, making a fool of themselves by getting up in front of the class or by doing something different. Or it just might be scary because it's just not what they're used to. And they need things that they are used to. So understand, while you can do those things, you can do fun things, you may need to prep your student first. You may need to pull them aside and say, hey, tomorrow we're going to do this really cool thing. I need you to keep it a secret, but I want to let you know. So when you come in tomorrow, the classroom is going to look a little different. Or like when I would change seats in the room, I would pull my students aside and say, hey guys, so tomorrow I'm going to change the seats and just so you know, don't tell anybody, but like you're going to be here and you're going to be here and it's going to be awesome. This is going to be a great spot for you and like no matter what, you're still in this classroom and you are so safe in here and you are so loved and just reiterate that every time. But just giving them a heads up to those things makes a huge difference. So that can be kind of make or break it for these students. It is also crucial to be proactive with these student so if you know that a student has a tendency to get dysregulated or that window of tolerance fills up pretty quickly then having some routines in place for when they feel dysregulated and some strategies can be really really helpful you're not going to be able to teach those strategies when the child is dysregulated so they need to be taught when the child is regulated and is able to understand what you're saying to them so having some ideas for like a cool down crate or a cool down corner I've seen or I do um, like mindful breathing. So we'll do belly breaths or we'll do five finger breaths where they have to breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Um, we talk about all sorts of deep breathing techniques. We'll do um, some songs, stuff like that. So whatever you can figure out in your room to teach your kids that work for you, work developmentally for the age level that you're working with, those things are crucial to teach to the children who tend to get dysregulated. But honestly, I think they're helpful for the entire class. Like I've told my class, like I do deep belly breaths when I am nervous about something all the time and I'm a grown up and it's important for me to know how to regulate my body. So I teach that to the whole class, but having those strategies in place is going to really help because then when your child becomes dysregulated, you can say, hey, remember like we have those deep belly breaths. Like if you wanna do it with me, I think I'm gonna do some deep belly breaths. Or I'm gonna do some five finger breaths. And you're able to do that with the student if they are able to do it with you. Now, there are gonna be times potentially where your child is so dysregulated that you suggesting deep belly breaths like no 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 they are way past deep belly breaths like they are out the door they're running into traffic like literally or figuratively like I'm not it just depends and so sometimes the deep belly breaths aren't gonna work and that's okay the important thing to remember is it's not about you you need to take your pride card and you need to throw it out the window because being a teacher is hard it's really, really hard. And I know you want your students to respect you and love you and think that you're the boss. But at the same time, that is not what the dysregulated child needs. Like you don't want to get into a power struggle where you're saying, well, I'm the teacher and you have to do this because you don't want just a compliant child. You want a child who is learning the skills that they're going to need for the rest of their lives. So if you are able to teach this child how to regulate themselves and teach them strategies and ways to cool down and, and blah, 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 then that's going to be so much more beneficial than teaching them to just hide their emotions and be quiet. We don't want that. It is okay to not be okay. And it's important that the kids know that. It's okay to get upset. It's okay to feel angry sometimes. And like the lives that these kids have, like they should be angry. Like we should be angry for them. Like it stinks. It's crazy. And so it's so important that we have that empathy as teachers. But we are humans. And sometimes you're gonna feel frustrated or you're gonna feel angry. And so it's so important that you take a second to regulate yourself before you address that child. So even if that means you need to turn away from the child for a second, take a couple deep breaths, say a quick prayer if you need to, and then turn to the child. Do it because you are not going to be any help to that child if you are condescending or patronizing or disrespectful to them or you have body language that is frightening to them. Like that is no help to that student. That will not help them regulate. You need to be predictable. You need to be the calm within their chaos. It is so important. And I saw something on Instagram recently that said, he is not giving you a hard time. He's having a hard time. And I think that's such an important thing to remember. Like he is not, or she, he or she is not trying to make your life miserable, okay? 
he or she is having a difficult time and this is how they are expressing it. This is how they are asking for love. And children who need the most love are often going to ask for love in the most unlovable ways, okay? They are going to be the ones who say, I hate you, I hate you, you're the worst teacher ever. And they don't mean that. They really, really don't. They mean, I need help, I'm scared, I'm worried, I'm dealing with a lot right now. And the translation there, it's tricky. It's really, really tricky. <sighs> Something that I found to be very beneficial is just talking aloud what's going on in the situation. So when a child is way up here and super dysregulated, that's when I'll say, man, you look really angry right now. And you don't always need to be super calm because sometimes the kids, you're calm, like freaks them out. So you don't need to be like whispering like, wow, you look really upset. You don't necessarily need to do that. Maybe that will work for some kids, but you also could be like, wow, you're really upset right now. I can tell you're really upset. And they'll go, yeah, yeah, I am upset. And you're like, man, I'm, you know, I saw that you forgot your homework and, and that must have really bummed you out this morning, huh? And they'll go, yeah, it did. And then you could even say something like, you must feel really rotten right now. I can tell you feel really rotten and really sad and, and really bummed about what's going on. Ugh. And when a child says something like, I'm the worst kid in the world, I hate myself. Your natural instinct will be to say, no, you're not, that's not true. But in that moment, that's not necessarily what the child needs to hear. Instead, saying something like, wow, I can't imagine feeling like that. That must be so hard to feel like you are the worst kid in the world. Wow. Wow, that is so hard. And just empathizing with the student and speaking aloud what they're feeling and kind of just validating their feelings is really crucial. And then also saying things like, you know, you're safe. You are safe in this classroom. My job is to keep you safe and I will do that. I promise you, you are safe. I love you. I care for you and I am here for you no matter what, unconditionally. I am here. And just saying that over and over because these kids when they're in that fight or flight mode, they are feeling so unsafe. They sometimes are feeling like they are going to die, like it is life or death, whatever they are going through in that moment. And it is incredibly scary for them. So just reiterating that you are there, you care about them, you love them, they are safe. That's really, really important. So I hope this video was helpful. I'm gonna link below the Help for Billy book as well as a few articles that I've read that I found helpful. And if you guys find any additional resources or know of any books or anything that you think that people should know about, please leave them in a comment below. And I maybe will pin like one or two to the top if I can. Uh, and I would love to share some more resources that way. So thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope that you found this at least somewhat helpful. And like I said before, or if you want any additional information or if you have any additional questions, please leave them in a comment below. I would love to help in any way that I can. I am super passionate about teaching these students, about teaching the kids who are sometimes hard to love and just loving them deeply and unconditionally. I think that it is so necessary and I think it is so possible to make a difference in these children's lives, even though it's not always the easiest. <laughs> if you liked this video and would like to see more on my channel, please make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. You can also follow Follow me on Instagram at Elementary in the Mitten. For now, though, thanks so much for watching. Remember that you're incredibly beautiful and loved, and you are not the worst teacher ever. And I will see you guys next time. Bye, guys.